Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cosmic Coffee here at Lowell Observatory. Um, I am filling in today for Jeff Hall, who is uh, not able to be with us um, for this particular episode of Cosmic Coffee. Uh, my name is Danielle Adams, and I'm the Deputy Director for Marketing and Communications at Lowell, um, but I'm also a cultural astronomer, and um, that's going to be a, a fun thing as we go on um, our episode today. So our guest uh, this week is Kevin White, who is one of our public program supervisors, and Kevin's been at Lowell for about 10 years and uh, is really uh, one of our solid rocks for all kinds of astronomy knowledge, and um, he is going to be helping us go through the sky um, as we're um, turning into uh, the spring constellations. And, um, you know, we'll just have a nice uh, uh, jaunt through the spring skies and uh, look at uh, some fun things to see, as well as uh, go a bit into uh, some of our Greek uh, history. Um, on my part, I'll also bring in some of uh, the Arabian uh, views of the same stars. So it should be quite fun here. Um, as Kevin uh, gets going, you may recognize his voice. Uh, he is uh, the mastermind behind our Sagas in the Sky series, which we post um, at this point every other week. And that looks at some uh, aspect of um, you know, a, a con could be a constellation or planetary bodies or solar system bodies um, and just dives into the mythology behind some of those names. So Kevin, uh, welcome. And uh, yeah, it's great to have you here on Cosmic Coffee. Yeah, thanks, um, it's great to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, we're gonna uh, get started uh, looking at the Northern portion of the sky. Um, and Kevin, take us away. Yeah, so, um, so I've been, so one of the things I do as supervisor is I actually, um, I've been teaching um, new staff and volunteers how to find constellations for several years now. And um, one of the ways I teach um, how to do that is sort of by finding landmarks in the sky and going from that. And we have one of the best landmarks for um, the whole sky right now, and that's the Big Dipper. So I'm going to pull up Stellarium real quick and share my screen. There we go. All right, so you can recognize the Big Dipper over here. I don't, um, I, can you all see my mouse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, the, um, so we have the Big Dipper over here. And the Big Dipper is actually basically the closest open star cluster to us. Almost all the stars in it, not quite every single one. Um, I, I think this one here and this one here aren't techni technically part of the star cluster. They're just sort of stars in this area that are passing through. But most of the Dipper stars are part of um, this group called the Ursa Major Moving Group, which is basically this um, large open star cluster. There are stars that form together probably and are all sort of moving in the same direction. And it's basically the closest open star cluster to us. Um, so the Big Dipper is also part of a larger constellation called Ursa Major, which is the Great Bear. And Ursa Major, it's, we have, so these six stars right here, so this, um, so this one and this one, and then the Cup of the Dipper, those are basically the bear's torso. And then these three stars right here are the bear's head. And it's an upside down bear. So right now, um, at least how it's oriented right now. So these, um, this sort of little triangle right here, those are the bear's front paws. And then this triangle back here is the bear's hind paws. And then these three stars behind the bear over here are the bear's exceptionally long tail. At least, at least in terms of the Greek canon. Yeah, there's there's a reason for that long tail, isn't there? Yeah. So the um, so this one of the stories, and there's you know there's lots of actually different stories in different cultures as to why the bear has this tail or what those three stars actually are. In the classical Greek canon, it's basically because okay, so 
the bear is a representation of a previous woman who got turned into a bear named Callisto. And Callisto was many paramours of the of the god Zeus, who you know you probably all recognize as the head of the, as the head Greek god in the in the Greek mythological canon. So Zeus, uh, you know, had this affair with with Callisto, and his wife Hera did not did not like that he had had this affair, and Zeus was worried that Hera might try to do something to her. So Zeus tried to hide the evidence of his affair by turning Callisto into a gigantic bear. Now, before, um, now as this, all, all this was happening, Callisto actually bore Zeus a son, and the son's name was Arcus. And, Ar and Callisto gave birth to Arcus um, just before she got turned into a bear, and Arcus grew up into this, you know, a very healthy, strong man who was a very skilled hunter. And one day Arcus was out hunting and, um, and he approached this bear that unknown to him was actually his mother Callisto. And the bear recognized Arcus and, start, and wanted to give him a hug and started running toward him. And Arcus, you know, seeing this gigantic bear running at him, panicked and, you know, and took out his bow and, and drew it and was ready to shoot the bear. And Zeus saw this happen and didn't want, you know, didn't want Callisto to be shot and killed by, by her own son. And so his solution to this was to turn Arcus into a bear too. And that bear is actually represented by the Little Dipper, also known as Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, which are these stars over here, which we'll talk about more in a, in a minute. So Zeus turned Arcus also into a bear. And then, um, because he was worried that Callisto might, sorry, he was worried that Hera might try to cause trouble for, um, for, um, for these two bears, he tossed them up into the sky. And when he tossed them, he kind of like swung them around by their rear ends and tossed and, you know, threw them up into the sky by the rear ends. And in the process, their rear ends got stretched out into these gigantically long tails. So in the classical Greek canon, that's why the two bears have their tails, because Zeus threw them up into the sky um, by their rear ends. <laughs> Ouch. Um, yeah, so those are uh, quite some long tails. Um, and of course, the uh, Ursa Major really is more complete, um, you know, in terms of also seeing legs and, and a head and whatnot. Um, uh, one of our, our viewers is uh, asked, are we looking um, at the view from the Southern Hemisphere? Um, and it may be that uh, you're not used to seeing the Big Dipper upside down like this. But uh, perhaps, Kevin, you could zoom out a bit so we can see. Yeah, yeah, I'll zoom out. So um, yeah. I'm on this. I'm on the program Stellarium, which you've, you you might have seen us used before if you um, if you've been watching Cosmic Coffee. It's a really nice program. It's open source, uh, so it's actually free on most platforms, and it's really good. So um, this is the view actually from Flagstaff, Arizona, um, as it would be at about eleven o'clock tonight. So let me actually. Um, so yeah, we're seeing the bear upside down. Um, one of the variants of the story I talked about to Callisto about Callisto earlier is that the bears. Um, this isn't actually true from here in Flagstaff, we're a little bit too far south. But um, from from Greece at the time, the bears would always be in the sky, and one of the stories behind that is Hera cursed them that they would never touch water because she didn't like that Callisto had that Callisto had escaped, I guess. Mm. But um, well, this isn't working, but okay. Well, that's not working, so I might just have to. Oh, my. Okay, so I might just have to close and reopen Stellarium. Oh, okay. Sorry no. about that. Um, while you're doing that, uh, uh -huh. that's actually a great time for me to 
um, share a, a view of the Arabian story behind these Thanks. sacred cars. So um, as we get going here, this is the same star field, just a um, static image here. And we've got our Big Dipper and we've got our Little Dipper. And you can always find uh, Polaris, uh, the North Star, by taking the two stars in the end of the bucket of the Big Dipper and connecting the dots and following the line through to the North Star. Now, uh, in Arabia, uh, long ago, and, and sometimes it's still recognized today, um, this asterism of the Big Dipper was known as the children of the beer, um, uh, a beer being a, you know, basically a, you know, a simple wooden bed um, that you would carry a dead person on. So basically we have a funeral procession. And so the four stars that make up the bowl of the dipper would be the beer itself. And then the three um, bright stars in the handle of the dipper uh, were the children, uh, just family members following behind the beer in the funeral procession. Um, so, you know, this was the big one. And so there was also recognition of um, a smaller beer. So we have the children of the larger beer, children of the smaller beer, like the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, um, except there were other names also used. Um, you find there's a lot of layering for um, many of the Arabian stars. And so if we focus on uh, the Big Dipper stars, each of these three stars in the handle um, had a name. So this one was called El Qaid, the leader of the horses or camels. And today we call that star Al Qaid still, comes from that name. Um, this middle star was the she kid, um, uh, like a, a female young goat. Um, and then this star was uh, the black camel or the black horse. Now, very close to this star, the she kid, um, is a smaller, uh, fainter star uh, as seen from Earth here. And you may know uh, this pair as Alcor and Mizar. Well, in uh, Arabian astronomy, uh, the fainter one was known as the overlooked one, a Soha. And there was a phrase that said, um, uh, I show her the overlooked one and she shows me the moon. Um, and so it apparently was uh, some phrase uh, uttered between, um, you know, lovers or romantic ones. Um, but it's an interesting piece there. Uh, but it was called the overlooked one because, you know, you can see it. It's, it's been used across many cultures as a test of eyesight. But um, you may not notice it unless you're actually looking for it. So um, the overlooked one. Yeah. When you're ready, I have a, um, I actually have a picture of the, of the Big Dipper that shows, um, that, shows that star pretty well. Um, and uh, while you're getting that, there's a question. Um, uh, let me see. Oh, yes. So the, um, the children of the beer is specifically from Arabian culture, um, from their own uh, mythology and stories. Yep. So oh. I, I, know, I know I'm going to mispronounce this name, but um, this is a, a photograph of the Big Dipper taken by R Rogelio um, Bernal Andreo, who's a absolutely fantastic astrophotographer. He puts out some some just incredible stuff, um, which which he also makes available for public use, which is incredibly generous. Um, so his website is, is worth a visit if you want. Um, he he put it he put out one of the um, one of the best uh, photographs of the constellation, or probably the best photograph of the constellation Orion that I've ever seen. But um, here's a deep here's a very deep sky view of the Big Dipper. And a, a few things you can see. There's a couple galaxies you can see. There's the one of several galaxies to be called the Pinwheel Galaxy right there. Um, the famous Whirlpool Galaxies right here. But you can see here's um, Mizar. 
And here's its um, friend Alcor right there. Yep. Or the she kid and the overlooked one. The she kid and the overlooked one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great image. Good illustration there. Yeah. All right. So if it's okay, I'll um, let's see. If it's okay, I'll, I think I got Stellarium working. We'll we'll see. Okay, great. Okay, can you all, you, you can all see this? Yeah. So to um, answer an earlier question, so to answer the earlier question, you know, as you as you may know, so we have the two point, um, these two stars, the Big Dipper, they point right to Polaris, the North Star, which is that star right there. And as the Earth turns, Everything, um, everything will appear to make uh, to make circles around the star Polaris. So basically, by literal cosmic coincidence, Polaris is almost directly above the Earth North Pole at this instant in cosmological time. So um, you can kind of see this. So if you were farther north, you can sort of see the the bear. Um, you know, as we progress time, it's going to be. You know, it's going to be moving, of course, east to west around the North Star, and it's going to be moving from our pers our perspective over here further and further toward the ground. And a lot of it, even here in Flagstaff, will never quite touch the ground. And I'm going to stop here because, well, I guess I don't have to. I can just turn the air off, which is not something I want to do in real life, but which is nice and still airy. <laughs> so we can, can continue and... Um, so one um, one interesting thing is by looking at where the North Star is, the higher the higher um, the higher you are in um, I keep getting latitude and longitude mixed up, but the higher you are in latitude, mm -hmm. the higher that Polaris will appear in the sky, and everything else shifts accordingly. So if you were just a little bit higher than Flagstaff, then Ursa Major will appear in the sky at all times. Um, because you can see from here, it just barely dips below the horizon. So I guess from Flagstaff, Callisto actually gets um, actually gets uh, actually gets to bathe in the ocean, unlike. Mm -hmm. But then um, you can see, and then she'll come around the you know she'll come around the other side. Mm -hmm. And this is the view as you would see from well about four o'clock in the afternoon if the sun weren't there. So, um, so yeah, so if you were just a little bit farther north and you'd be able to see her at all times and you, she would be sometimes both right side up and sometimes upside down. Um, but from, but yeah, this is the view from Flagstaff. Now, um, one other interesting thing is I mentioned earlier that the farther you are north, the higher the North Star appears in the sky. If you're below the equator, then um, if you're below the, Earth, the equator, or sorry, I shouldn't say below, if you're farther south than the equator, then the North Star is always below the horizon. Mm -hmm. And and everything else also shifts accordingly from there. So you go farther and farther south, you start being able to see stuff that we can't see at all from the Northern Hemisphere, but also you, st so you stop being able to see stuff that we can. And you don't have to go very far south before, um, before the Big Bear disappears entirely. Um, so we've been talking about uh, bears so far. And, um, you know, in our title this morning, uh, it's Lions, Dragons, and Bears, Oh My. So we've got bears down. Um, perhaps we should take a look at uh, the giant dragon in the sky. Right. And that dragon is Draco. So Draco is, I'm going to turn on the stick figures so, you, so we can all see this better. So Draco is this constellation here. And we'll, um, the way that I find it, so we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about Heracles or Hercules probably a, a lot more during the next cause, um, during a, another cosmic coffee down the line. But um, this constellation right here is Hercules or the kneeling man. And Hercules is traditionally stepping on Draco's head. And part of the reason I mentioned that is I, I, haven't, I personally have an easier time finding Hercules than Draco. 
And so I, I use her, I use Hercules to find Draco, but um, mm -hmm. so Hercules, you know, his, this foot, like the way that he's usually portrayed is that we have his torso here and then his two feet are both bent because he's kneeling. And this foot right here is stepping on the head of the dragon, which is right here. Mm -hmm. So Hercules has defeated the dragon and is stepping on its head triumphantly. And the dragon is a very long, windy constellation. And actually, when I was a kid, I was sort of convinced that it was one of the, it was like something where, oh, we need to fill this area of the sky and dragons can look like anything. So let's call it a dragon. Um, but it turns out that it's actually one of the older constellations. Um, and it's very long, very windy. So it winds down over this way and then comes back over this way and then ends up between the two dippers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is actually up during the whole year, but its head is, um, is up mostly during the spring and summer. Mm -hmm. So we have its head here again, and its um, body winds down over this way and then comes back up and ends up between the two dippers. So another very mythologically rich constellation, again, a very, a very old constellation. Um, I have one of my favorite um, stories, which um, I've read this in just in not every source, but I've read it in a few relatively reliable sources that Draco was sometimes associated with Tiamat who in ancient Mesopotamian mythology was this sort of um, dragon that represented primordial chaos. Um, Tiamat was one of the two primordial gods. And that's a whole other story that we could get into later if, or during another show if anybody wants us to. Um, in, the, um, in the classical Greek canon, um, in the classical Greek canon, this dragon represents a couple different dragons. It's occasionally the dragon who was killed by Cadmus who would go on to um, to found, I think it was the city of Thebes, or the, um, but most uh, more famously, this is the dragon that was um, fought by, Her by Hercules as one of his labors. And the story behind that basically, so Hercules, he was driven, um, he was driven to madness by Hera because again, he was an illegitimate son of Zeus and Hera didn't like that. And so she made Hercules' life really hard for him. And, and she, um, for, she messed with his brain and forced him to kill his, um, his family, which was not nice. So Hercules was seeking to atone for this. So he took on the, he, he took on the responsibility to kill um, or to, to do a bunch of, almost impossible tasks. And one of those tasks was to, um, was to fetch a bunch of apples that were being guarded by this giant ferocious dragon. And there's a couple of different ways that he went about this. The more straightforward way is that he basically just shot the dragon with arrows. Um, in, one of pre in one of Hercules' previous labors, he had slain the Hydra, which is another constellation we'll talk about in a bit. And the Hydra's blood was so poisonous that would, it would just basically instantly kill anything it had touched. And so Hercules um, dipped his arrows in the blood of this Hydra, and that made them so toxic that just, a, just one of them could kill this dragon. Um, the other variant of the story, with this maybe a little bit more interesting, but also maybe makes less sense as to why Hercules might be stepping on, might be stepping on triumphantly on the head of this dragon, is that Hercules has Atlas, the Titan Atlas, do it for him. So Atlas is the is the guy that um, he he fought against the he fought on the wrong side of the war against the Olympians and the Titans, and as punishment, he holds up the sky. And so Hercules goes to Atlas and says, hey, Atlas, um, I need a favor. There's this dragon that I have to get past to, to get these apples. Would you mind beating the dragon for me? And Atlas says, sure, but, um, you know, to do that, I, you know, I'm kind of tasked with holding up the sky and it's going to be bad if it falls to the earth. So would you mind holding it up for me for a few minutes if, while I take care of that for you? And um, Hercules says, yeah, of course, I can do that for you. So Hercules takes the sky from Atlas and holds it up while Atlas go, goes and kills this dragon. And Atlas goes and does the deed and then comes back to Hercules and says, um, hey, Hercules, I killed the dragon, but I've, uh, it's, I've, it's kind of nice not having to hold up the sky all the time. So I think I'm going to let you do it for a while. And Hercules um, says, okay, well, I, I guess, I guess if I have to, I will, but it's, it's kind of been an uncomfortable position. It's like chafing on my neck. Um, would you mind taking it back for just a second while I like just get into a little bit of a more comfortable position to hold it up? And Atlas says, well, sure, I guess that's okay. And then as soon as Atlas takes the sky back, Hercules runs like heck. Hmm. 
So, um, so that's those are the two stories as to how Hercules beats the dragon Draco. Wow, and it and it's nice that um, you know in the the stick figures again uh, we've got Hercules' foot right there um, uh, next to the the head of Draco. Um, if you would let me share my screen, um, we've got a very different picture of these stars in the Arabian sky. So uh, here again, we've got uh, the same star field. So we've got uh, the head of Draco and the body going along this way between the two, uh, excuse me, the two dippers. Now, in Arabian astronomy, the head of Draco, um, it, it's not the head of a dragon. Um, this is a group of four stars known as the Camel Mothers. And so the four stars in the head were the mothers, and there's a faint star in the middle of those four, and that was called the Young Camel. And so, um, you know, you can imagine uh, this is a a specific term for a camel that has been born in the spring. And so um, it's been born very recently and um, uh, it's being protected by uh, four uh, female camels. And what's it being protected from? Well, if we widen out the, the view a little bit, we've got two stars here that are, are part of the Greek Draco, but these were seen as two wolves and they are threatening the young camel. And so uh, the camel mothers surround the camel to protect the young camel. And then down here, uh, our very bright star Vega um, is coming from the Arabic Anusser al waqia The waqia is what turned into Vega. And it's the alighting vulture, the vulture that's um, getting ready to land. And so uh, the vulture comes in also to help protect uh, the young camel from the two wolves. And so we have this interesting scene in the Arabian sky. So um, yeah, uh, one of the things I love about cultural astronomy and these stories is that the date is the same. It's the same dots in the sky. And you know, as long as you're viewing from a similar latitude, you know, you pretty much see the same dots in the sky. Uh, as Kevin said, you know, the dots change a bit if you go up or down in latitude, but not across the earth in longitude. And so, you know, with the same dots, uh, two different cultures come up with very different stories to describe what's going on in the night sky there. So um, before we move away from the dragon to our next uh, piece of sky, there was a question in chat um, from Glenn Frank. Uh, hi, Glenn. Uh, how did sailors navigate south of the equator without a view of Polaris? And um, an interesting thing is that, uh, you know, we're, we're sometimes fixed on Polaris being the North Star and wow, what happens if you don't have a North Star? Well, you know, uh, in my research on Arabian astronomy, you just have to go back about 1,000 or 1,500 years, pretty much the whole first millennium uh, CE, had no North Star. Um, the Earth, as uh, we move through space, uh, we wobble a little bit like a top. And so the axis of the Earth traces this circle through the northern sky and also through the southern sky. And um, it means that it points in different places um, over the course of about 26,000 years. That, that's called precession of the equinoxes. And so just a thousand years ago, there was no North Star. Um, North was marked by what we know of as the North Star and a pair of stars in um, at the end of the Little Dipper, uh, Kokob and Firkut. Um so, so you don't need a single star to mark the direction. And so similarly, similarly in the southern sky, you can also mark the direction of south um, with stars that are close enough to that axis point in the sky where you can, you know, once you see those stars, you know you're pretty close to south. So um, yeah, even though there may not have been a south star, 
um, you know, the celestial navigation could still happen on the seas and, you know, over land. And uh, just in case anyone is curious, I just, on my stellar, uh, on my stellarium program, I just brought up the circle that the, um, so this right here, if you can see it, this is the, cir um, so as the earth spins, as the earth spins, it wobbles just, you know, just like a topple wobble as it spins, um, the earth does the exact same thing for basically the same reasons. Um, and so it wobbles and which, which is why, you know, where North points and South points in the sky is constantly changing. So this right here is the circle that true North makes. And we're just, we're really just exceptionally lucky right now because Polaris is both a, you know, it's a fairly good medium brightness star. And it's also about as close to being true North as any star is. I think it, um, I actually think that our North pole passed at uh, made its closest pass with Polaris, like within our lifetimes and like, late nineties or early two thousands or something. Mm -hmm. So we're really exceptionally lucky that we have such a good North star right now. Um, and, but you can see here, you know, to the two bright stars, Deneb and Vega, which are summer triangle stars. Again, we'll talk about those probably um, in an upcoming cosmic coffee. Those are, um, those will be the North star sometime in the future. And then this star actually right in here, um, Thuban, that was the North star a few thousand years ago. And a lot of ancient architecture, I'm, um, I've heard um, a lot of ancient architecture is um, aligned in different ways that involves Thuban because Thuban was the North star, you know, in like, in, in like the very late stone age or the very early bronze age. Mm-hmm. Well, um, let's uh, let's move along here, and um, uh, let's uh, Kevin uh, take care of the next two sections mm -hmm. together. Um, let's arc to Arcturus and Spike to Spica. All right. So let me just get rid of the procession circles on my Stellarium here. All right. Okay, back to Stellarium. So if we go back to the Big Dipper, like I mentioned, I'm going to rewind time here just a little bit. So like I said, the, the Big Dipper is a fantastic landmark for the sky. You can find so many different things with it. And as Daniel was saying, we have this really convenient saying, kind of a mnemonic device in astronomy. It's just arc to Arcturus and spike to spica. Um, Arcturus and Spica being two of the very brightest stars in the in the night sky. Arcturus, is, um, so we have the Dipper's handle here, and you can just follow the arc from that to Arcturus, and then on to Spica. And we say Spike to Spica because this constellation makes kind of a spike shape, or if you prefer, just because it sounds good. Um, so arc to Arcturus and Spike to Spica. Um, so Arcturus is the brightest star of the constellation of Boates, the herdsman. And it is the uh, one of the very brightest stars in the sky. It's it's tech, it's actually number four, um, and then from our latitude, it's basically the second brightest because the um, the second and third brightest overall, which are Canopus and Alpha Centauri, we can't see from this. We, we basically can't see it all from this far north. Um, Canopus just barely peaks above the horizon, and and um, Alpha Centauri you have to like go down into Mexico to be able to see it very well, or, or that far south. Um, so Arcturus is, and even those, both, both of those are just barely brighter than Arcturus is. Um, Arcturus is part of Boates, the herdsman, who is, um, so let me turn on my stick figures again. So basically this, you have this elongated diamond shape, which is often called the kite or the ice cream cone. And then you can see Arctur, um, Boates' legs coming out over this way. Um, Boates is the herder of the bears. So my favorite story, um, so the word Arcturus is, I think, um, ancient Greek language for the bear watcher. And um, so Arcturus is constantly watching the bears as they move across the sky. And one of the, um, one of the stories about Boates is that Boates is, is the herdsman who is herding the two bears around the North Star as the earth turns. Um, there's a few other stories about him, like we already talked about the story of Callisto and Arcus, um, and they both got turned into bears and threw in, thrown into the sky. And um, sometimes Boates represents Arcus in his while well, he's still in his human form. 
There's another story about him where Boethius represents a guy named Hy um, Hyginus, who was taught by the god of partying, Dionysus, how to make a, um, especially good wine. And he serves this wine to some of his um, to some of his friends in his in his village, and they um, they overindulge and pass out. And um, a bunch of the other villagers, uh, dis a bunch of the other villagers, assume that the um, that this drink had been poisoned, and it, rather than rather than their friends just drinking too much, and so. Apparently, without checking a pulse, pulses or for pulses or anything, they assume their friends had been killed, and they kill Hyginus in revenge. And um, they are later punished by the gods in, in various in various horrible ways. But um, but yeah, so that's um, those are some of the stories be, um, in the classical Greek canon behind Boethius. Great. And then, how about Spica? And then spica, um, spica, the word spica is actually Latin for the sheaf of wheat. And it is, um, and it's lo very long been associated with agriculture in various ways. Spica is part of the constellation of Virgo, which is a kind of, um, at least for the brighter constellations, it's one of the more sort of abstract ones. Um, I usually just teach people to sort of look for this box of the, um, these four stars right here. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, let me bring up the stick figure. Um, so you can see it actually extends a little bit farther out than this, like this star coming up over here is one of its limbs and it also comes up over this way. Um, Spica, uh, so Virgo is often associated with Persephone, which is one of the more famous stories. The story there basically is that um, Persephone was a son, um, excuse me, Persephone was a daughter of the goddess of the earth Demeter. And um, with the blessing of Zeus, Persephone was abducted by Hades, the god of the underworld. And um, Demeter had no idea what had happened and, you know, and searched all over the earth for her daughter and became so distraught that she, ref um, she refused to let anything at all grow. And so basically all life on earth was, faced with the, was facing extinction because Demeter was so angry. And so um, not wanting all life on earth to go extinct, Zeus sort of fessed up to what had happened or in some other versions, you know, other gods figured it out. But um, basically Zeus fesses up and sort of um, brokers this compromise between, um, between Hades and Demeter where, De um, where Persephone will spend half of the year with Hades and half of the year with, um, with, Perse with Demeter. And, um, during the half of the year that that Persephone is with Hades, Demeter grieves and won't let anything grow. And during the half of the year that um, Persephone is with Hades, excuse me, during the half of the year that Persephone is with Demeter, then Demeter is happy and plants will, and you know, and the, so the earth is happy and plants will grow and stuff. Um, and that's traditionally been associated with seasons. I've read in a few places that um, in the class, in the original sort of context, the time that Demeter is angry was actually associated with more of a, like a, the very, very hot and dry part of the year. Mm -hmm. But in sort of more modern times, I guess that um, the story of Persephone is more traditionally come to, been no, um, to be associated with the cycles between summer and winter, with Persephone's absence being associated with winter and Demeter is angry during winter and won't let anything grow during winter and then will allow things to grow during the spring and summer. And that actually fits really well with the constellation because Spike, um, because the um, Spica and Virgo are up during the spring and early summer and are under the horizon, you know, one could say in the underworld during the autumn and winter. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, yeah. Um, and I, I've read that there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of, a lot of this is a little bit speculative, but a lot of scholars think that a lot of ancient farmers would actually use spica directly for, um, to figure out when to plant because spica rises at, right after sunset, right at the beginning of spring, which is right when a lot of people would, would start planting their crops. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, and even uh, the nearby um, Coma Berenices, uh, was often uh, viewed as um, a spike of grain. Oh, yep. cool. I didn't because know that. The, the cluster has that kind of, um, it's not like a, a circular-ish cluster. It has kind of a, 
a shape like a, a yeah. Like a green or I can see that. Yeah. Now, Acoma Berenices is right behind um, Leo here, which I don't th think we've quite talked about Leo yet, but it was also for thousands of years considered the sort of the tuft at the end of the tail of the lion. Mm -hmm. And this grouping right. is also the third closest open star cluster to us after the big after the Earth's to major booming group and and the Hyades, which is a which is a formation in Taurus. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's press on to Leo and um, wrap up with Leo here. Uh, as promised, lions, dragons, and bears. We got a dragon. We got a couple bears. Um, now let's look at uh, a pair of lions. Um, we'll look at the Greek lion first, and then we'll wrap up with the Arabian lion. All right. So yeah. So um, the. So yeah, so Leo is, well, if you can still see the lines, this right here, it also actually includes the star right here. I'm not sure why, Stel why Stellarium doesn't attach that in the stick figure. But um, so Leo is, in the classical Greek stories, again, it's, it's associated with lots of different lines throughout, hi lines throughout history. In the, um, in the epic, if you have any... Um, if any of you ever heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Leo sometimes represents Humbaba, which is this lion, man, who's a sort of lion man beast, who's the guardian of the cedar forest, who's defeated by Gilgamesh on his path to sort of legendhood. Um, in the classical Greek canon, Leo represents the Nemean lion, who was fought, um, who was actually um, killed by Her by Hercules or Heracles as Heracles' first labor. And this was a lion with invincible skin, and it kept kidnapping people from a local village. And, and anyone who would go to try to rescue one of the people would be eaten by the lion. And so these villagers, you know, asked her, asked their king for help, and the king sent Heracles. And the king didn't like Heracles very much, so might have been hoping that the lion would sort of do Heracles in. But mm -hmm. um, but Heracles, but Heracles attempted to um, was. A very very skilled archer and first attempted to shoot the lion with uh, with arrows but this lion had skin that was impervious to any kind of weapon it was completely impenetrable so hercules um so hercules um he drove the he fought the lion and drove it into its cave so it was cornered and couldn't ex escape and then he he caught its claws and then strangled it and um, so, since since the lion couldn't be um, couldn't its hide couldn't be pierced by weapons, so strangling it was the only way to kill it. And afterwards, um, on the advice of Athena, Hercules um, skinned the lion with its own claws because its own claws were the only thing that could cut its skin. And so he skinned it and then used its hide as an invincible suit of armor. Nice. Um, the lion, incidentally, in the sky also has a basically a little brother or sister, and that's the little lion, which is actually right in between Leo and Ursa Major. So these stars right over here, those are the little lion. Um, isn't that Lynx? I think you need you need to go a little bit. Oh. It might, it might be. I might be. Like, oh, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, this is Leo. This is Leo oh, yeah, Minor. Yeah, so Link, Link's, over, Links yeah. is a super faint constellation that I can never find over here. And Leo Minor is, um, yeah, this sort of the way I usually picture yeah. it is this sort of almost arrow shape right in between Leo and and Ursa right. and, and Ursa Major. Kind of like Sagitta, just larger. Yeah, exactly. And so. Um, with uh, the, this Nimian lion, uh, then uh, does uh, Leo Minor figure into the story at all, or is it just the the larger one? Not that I've ever heard. I think it's just the larger one, I, and I think the I think the smaller one actually be a, actually might be a more modern invention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to take a look now at the Arabian view of the lion. And um, as we're uh, getting close to wrapping up here, if you have any um, uh, burning questions, uh, feel free to ask those in chat now and uh, we'll get to them uh, as much as we can. So uh, if you let me share my screen, Kevin. Oh, then, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, no worries. Um, then uh, we're going to look at the same star field, essentially. Again, this is more of a static uh, view. 
Uh, spring is, you know, a beautiful time to look at Leo. It's just due south, you know, high in the sky. And, um, you know, we have, uh, again, this bright star Regulus. Um, up here in the, the forehead is Ras al-Asad, which um, uh, comes from the Arabic uh, Ras al-Asad, the head of the lion. And then here, Denebola comes from the Arabic Dhanb uh, al-Asad, the tail of the lion. So that's all describing the Greek picture of the lion. Um, it turns out that uh, the Arabs had their own view of a lion in the sky, and it happened to cross over the same patch of sky, but it's very different, as you'll see. Yeah, that's a really big lion right there. Um, this is the giant Arabian lion, and for those of you who are aware of um, angular distances in the sky, this takes up about 135 degrees from claws to feet. Um, so we're starting here in um, Gemini and Canis Minor, going through Cancer to Leo, Virgo. This is Arcturus from Bootes and Spica from Virgo. Um, the tail, uh, as Kevin mentioned uh, here, is uh, the tufted tail in uh, the Arabian lion, uh, Coma berenices. And then, you know, these things grow over time. So uh, this here is um, this bright red star in um, Cain's Venatici, uh, which was seen as the liver of the lion, even though it's outside the body. Um, and then this here was the rump of the lion. Again, not connected, but, you know, these things tend to grow. So this is what all of the pieces of the lion looks like. And when you see it under a real sky, um, it's delightful. It's so enormous. And uh, one of my favorite parts is this here. Um, this is in the Greek constellation Cancer. Um, these two stars and the star cluster near it. The star cluster is called um, Precipi today. And uh, that's Messier 44, also known as the Beehive Cluster. Um, that uh, looks like a fuzzy spot in the sky when you're not using binoculars. And so it was seen to be the sneeze of the lion. Um, the particles sneezed out from the two nostril stars right here. So it's wonderfully descriptive. Um, and then we're actually going to come full circle back to um, Ursa Major because um, in this story of the Arabian lion, it was said that um, the lion got angry at some point and thumped its tail on the ground. And when it did that, the gazelles uh, got scared and leapt away. And when they leapt away, they left their tracks. And so this is the tail hair of the lion. And we have three pairs of stars. And these are the three leaps of the gazelles. And even today, their star names um, relate to that, Alula, Tania, Talitha, um, they each have two of them. So it's Alula Borealis, Alula Australis for the north and south ones of the pair, but that's the first, second, and third leaps of the gazelles. And these three pairs of stars happen to be the feet of Ursa Major as well. So that brings us around full circle um, back to where we started here, looking through this uh, spring sky. So I'm gonna stop my share there. And uh, doesn't look like we have any other questions at this point. So um, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. For yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. Uh, nice trip through um, uh, some of the major constellations of the spring sky. Um, be sure to stay uh, tuned next week for another episode of Cosmic Coffee. Um, next week happens to be International Dark Sky Week. And so uh, we'll have Chris Luganbuehl on the show uh, from the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition. And we'll be talking about the importance of dark skies, um, not just here in Flagstaff, but around the world. Um, so stay tuned for that next week. Um, and uh, once again, Kevin, thank you so very much for joining us here this morning. Thank you to all the viewers, and um, we'll see you next time.